Warning! 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 This is not a space weather video. This is just me talking about random things. Although, in this universe, very little is random. So, it'll never be now again. First thing I'd like to talk about is words. Yes, I'm going to talk about words. The first word, it's actually two words, I would like to add to the vernacular, and that's a synonym for smooth, baby's ass. In other words, was it an easy drive home from work today? Well, the drive home from work was baby's ass. Get it? It's not a term that's used, but it should be. We need new terms and new gestures before the language stagnates, right? Speaking of stagnation, Google is not a verb. So could you please stop using it as a verb? We would greatly appreciate it. If you're a lover of Google, that's all the more reason to stop using it as a verb because Google doesn't want you using Google as a verb. So, baby's ass as an adjective, meaning smooth, Google, not a verb. Just say search. If you say search, it's less syllables. Isn't it easier to say one syllable instead of two? Next, we would like to wish Alex Trebek, the beloved host of the game show Jeopardy, all the luck in the universe with his battle with pancreatic cancer. Now, he hilariously stated that he's not allowed to die because his contract still has uh, two more full years because he just renewed his three-year contract last year. Next, we want to talk about the origin of the name smash o -Mash. It is an old gaming name that was made up in 1998. And because I became a online public figure at that point, I decided to just keep the name. I have been a server admin on gaming servers, as well as message board servers, message board administration, all that stuff. Everything you have to do to run game servers, including uh, running the scrim team of two different gaming clans. Yes, we won't mention them because one of them is totally out of existence. I don't know. They both still exist in some context, I guess. We're thinking about bringing one back. It's just we're a little too busy to do so. So that's where the name came from. It was originally seen in Special Ops 2 Green Berets, a really old game that it's a great online game if nobody cheats. Unfortunately, some files in the game config are text files, which makes it kind of easy to cheat, if you know what I mean. Next, I want to talk about a little bit about my resume, how I'm qualified to talk about space weather. Now, I don't progress through things normally, first of all. All our viewers should probably understand this. I progress through things, you could say advanced. I first learned about cosmic rays before going to kindergarten while reading a world book atlas in about I guess it must have been 1984. I learned how to read at age three in hopes that I wouldn't have to go to school. I figured my f parents would have realized that I learned how to read at age three. Why do I have to go to school? I'll be able to learn whatever I need to know since I can read, right? Well, sadly, it wasn't the case. So I was disillusioned with education from day one. By the 90s, I was disillusioned enough to become a professional athlete instead of uh, an academic. I, I guess I saw the writing on the wall because college was not all it was cracked up to be. When you know more about the subject than a PhD professor, it's time to get out of there. Yes, there were no celebrity bribing scandals in the mid-90s, but I got out of college anyway because Again, 
I tend to take the advanced route. For instance, I learned to skateboard in about 1983. Not because it was easy, because it's about the hardest thing in the world to do. And uh, yeah, I've fallen down steps tens of thousands of times, probably. I've fallen on asphalt tens of thousands of times for sure, and then crashed lots of bikes. So, I've got a lot of experience in things like Taekwondo, various other martial arts. Regarding the rest of my training, it's private. It's... I'm not going to give you a bibliography for everything I know, sorry. Now, once I took up cycling, I had to learn skills that I didn't have. I had to push my body to limits that had not been reached, right? That sent me down a rabbit hole of things like the weather and the sun and the climate. And actually, it sent me down a rabbit hole of the supernatural as well, believe it or not, which I'll get into in a minute, right after I start talking about the solar nova. That's becoming popular information now. So regarding that, I'd like to say that I believe the solar nova comes out of a coronal hole, not out of a sunspot. Now, I'm fairly sure that there are other channels out there on YouTube that think the solar nova comes out of a sunspot, and I'm pretty sure they're incorrect. I think that is out of phase with what we see in the geologic record. Anybody who knows more about this than I do, please comment below and correct me. But I am known to be wrong regularly, and I lunge at the opportunity to be wrong, as it will teach me something about the science. Now, <clears throat> I think a coronal hole would be the source. First of all, has anybody seen a coronal hole that connects the North and South Pole? No. I don't remember ever seeing one. I've seen ones that are associated with the North and South Pole of the Sun. I've seen coronal holes that stay in place for months at a time. That's, that's a thing. But the idea that the solar nova happens at a solar maximum, I'm not so sure. So, in any case, we're coming off the current solar minimum, and I believe people like Rolf Vichy will agree with me in that the solar nova comes out of a coronal hole, not out of a sunspot. Now, I would like to get Mr. Vichy on the channel, and we're going to reach out to him momentarily here in the next week or so. We also have uh, an interview with an airline pilot. I think he's, I think he'll he'll allow me to state that he's an airline pilot. At least we're not going to say his name, <clears throat> unless he unless he uh, authorizes that or anything like that. And so we got some interesting questions to ask him. We did turn him on to uh, websites like SpaceWeather.com because uh, he actually has limited his flight hours due to cosmic ray flux. Believe it or not, it's true. So anyway, there's a lot of stuff coming up. And the deal is, we're more than happy to be wrong. We would prefer to be right. We're more than happy to be wrong. This is the way science is done. Don't try to shut down your detractors because your detractors could be your greatest ally. Next, let's talk about the rabbit hole of the supernatural in cycling. Oh, yeah. So here we are at the fireside chat, and we've got a little bit of a ghost story here. We're not going to edit the video because it takes too long. It's a pretty long video. So let's get to the story of the wraiths or the Wraith, as I've never seen more than one at the same time, but I've seen a Wraith probably 50 or 60 times, I'd say. At least 30 times. I'll say 30 times. And I can create a map and show everybody where this phenomenon happened over and over again in the woods. I'm not sure that would do anybody any good, 
I could show you where it is. It's, uh, it's near Emmaus, Pennsylvania, near some mountain bike trails. And uh, so anyway, here's the story. So what happened was, I think it was my first year of cycling. It should have been the fall of 1997. I was riding with my cycling mentor, tattoo artist, Ron Wexler. And we were on a section of the mountain that I'd never been to before. And so I didn't know the trails. And it was a fall day in November. After all the leaves had fallen off and just after some rain. So it was, the skies were still gray. It was very dark. There was very low contrast. Uh, the leaves were all yellow and they were all on the, on the, on the forest floor and on the trail making it a little more dangerous because they were wet. And since I was on unfamiliar trails, I didn't want to get dropped and lost. And on a downhill, I started to feel like I was going to get dropped because uh, I had to slow down quite a bit because of rocks. And uh, as this happened, I started to think, man, I'm going to get dropped here. And then I'm not going to know where I am. I'm going to get lost, although it's not very far from a major road. I still didn't want to get lost because it would screw up everybody's workout, right? So I'm getting worried about getting dropped and I'm jamming on the brakes when this happens. And I should make a caveat and say when this happens, I mean, I see my friend and cycling mentor Ron over there on the left side of the trail. So what I believe has occurred is that he has made a sharp turn on this downhill on a switchback and now he's over to my left. So I'm looking for a place to turn left when I see him over there on the left side of the trail. And when I say I see him, here's what I mean. Now this isn't Ron. This is a rival cycling team from which he had a jersey for some reason. I don't know. Somebody gave him a jersey for whatever reason. The Philadelphia Flyers sponsor this, sponsored this cycling team at the time in 1997. It was called Scott by Kyle. They were sponsored by the, by the bicycle manufacturer Scott. And by Kyle, I believe it's Mainline Cyclery near Philadelphia. Mainline. Anybody who knows better, correct me, please. Uh, so yeah, very distinct Jersey. And he wore that orange Jersey in, in the fall and the winter on purpose to avoid getting shot while riding in the woods, right? Hunters wear orange. So should you. So I see the Jersey to my left and on top of the Jersey, I see very, very distinct Mario Cipollini esque Brico glasses. It wasn't this exact model, but it was very similar. And I see his green Bell Evo 2 helmet. Now, I'm looking for all these things. His wasn't yellow like this one. His was green. But the most advanced and lightest weight helmet at the time was the Bell Evo 2. So I see all this stuff. Because remember, when we're riding the bike, we're all wearing a disguise, essentially. And uh, you got to look at each other's bikes and gear to be able to tell who you're talking to and stuff. So I'm looking for the glasses and the helmet and the jersey. I see it on the left. And I now I really jam on the brakes. So I jam on the brakes. And then I see this on my right. And that's when I realize something funny is going on. Because he's obviously not on the left and on the right of the trail. So now I realize something funky is happening. I feel like I'm in a D&D &D game. And I go, that's weird. I've never uh, encountered a doppelganger before that tries to copy somebody. But it seems like uh, it only did it the first time. And after that, I just saw a black silhouette. But the weirdest part is what happened after that. After that, I noticed that Ron was in plain view the whole time. Because when I got spooked by the silhouette on the right side of the trail, I thought, not only is he not on both sides of the trail, 
but something real weird's going on here. So, yeah, I hear chain slap in front of me, and I look, and I can clearly tell that he was in plain view the whole time. Now, most people, when they see a wraith, when they hear the word wraith, they think of that. And that is not what I saw. I never saw the phenomenon move. And after that, I only ever saw a black silhouette. I continued to use the trails for years. And it didn't matter. It didn't seem to matter if it was a sunny day or a rainy day or... It didn't matter. Um, going uphill, going downhill, you know, people are going to say, well, you were climbing, you were hypoxic because you were riding a mountain bike. But it would happen while downhilling, while uphilling. And the weirdest part is, now, I'm sure anybody who's been in the woods understands this. When you're in the woods and you see an object, you see a silhouette to your right or your left out of your peripheral vision, typically when you look at that silhouette, and try to figure out what that really is. If it's shaped like a person, usually you see something, uh, something there, like a, like an old rotten log. You know, at, at an odd focal length that you weren't expecting, that was blurry because it's like in your peripheral vision. But every time I saw the phenomenon, I'd look and there would be absolutely nothing at all there. So that's the story of the wraiths. Now, keep in mind, afterwards, there was an odd crash, too, um, on the same day. Let me just review my notes here. Yeah, so. Showed up like a doppelganger, and then it looked like a black silhouette. It never moved. It never threatened me. I never had a weird feeling. There was no sulfur smell. There was no nothing. It was a visual phenomenon only, but it happened dozens of times all in the same place. This is not an area where I would camp at nighttime. And there is the foundation of an old house that is no longer, you know, only the foundation is, is visible there at this point. A little later in that same ride, um, Ron had a bizarre crash where a, pen, uh, a small twig about the size of your pinky um, which was perfectly beveled on the one end, about the size of a golf pencil. Just imagine a golf pencil. Instead of being pointy at the end, it was only like diagonal at the end, right? Stuck right in between his V-brake, his V-brake pad and his, uh, his rim. He crashed. He started bleeding quite a bit out of, out of an old injury on his one arm. And the, the stick was jammed in his rim so hard that I had to bang it on the ground to unstick his front wheel so it would turn again. Well, that was kind of a little odd little thing that happened there at the end of the ride. It was kind of at the bottom of the same portion of the mountain where I saw the doppelganger slash wraith thing. So cycling has led me down many rabbit holes and one of them is being able to predict the weather. At some point, I realized that there's more that goes into weather than barometric pressure, humidity, temperature, winds. There's something else going on, and guess what it is? It's the sun. Now, I started studying it real in-depth in 2003 via spaceweather.com. So, anyway, just wanted to share that little story with you there. Let's put the fireplace back up so you can stop freaking out about wraiths. There we go. Now we're back to a nice smash-o fireside chat here. Like I'm the president of my own channel. So. I was thinking about reporting some hate crimes against myself today. I decided not to do that. Um, seems a little unwise in light of recent events. Also, while we're inventing words, let's invent some gestures, too. Here's my next... Uh, my next idea, let's start doing the loser symbol like they do on Top Gear, the British Top Gear, you know? Let's start doing the loser symbol instead of the middle finger. 
no middle finger, loser symbol. It's way better. It's less provocative. It could prevent some road rage, in, some road rage incidents, and it could cause some people to laugh their asses off when they realize that they're being called a loser instead of having somebody say, F you! It's a totally different vibe. Get people out of their zone of wanting to fight you because they're jacked up because they're driving a car. It's stupid. Also, check out our pro driving tips on Instagram. As I drive about a thousand miles a week, I have a lot of insight into what hacks are doing on the highways. And here's what I do. I make everybody a little bit safer by slowing down a little early and putting on my four ways and getting the hell out of the way of things that are going to kill me. You should do the same. Have a checklist. Only do stuff that makes you safer on the road. Don't do any things that make you less safe. All right, enough driving crap. Seriously, get off your phone if you're driving. Get the hell off your phone. Put your phone down. Don't try to read it. Don't try to send texts. In Pennsylvania, you can look at your navigation software, and that's about it. And it's a smart law, believe it or not. Last year in, uh, I'm sorry, in 2017, I'm not sure the 2018 stats yet, they're probably still being compiled. Pennsylvania set a new record for the most pedestrian deaths. And I blame it on the smartphone. Here's another segue. I blame my not appearing on camera very much on facial hair. I'm not a facial hair guy. I don't want people to have a distorted idea of what I look like. So greatly limiting my camera time for that reason, right? Now, let's go back to cycling. Cycling is a sport like no other sport. The bicycle is the most efficient means ever devised to transport human beings. Did you get that? Let me repeat that. Cycling is the most efficient means ever devised to transport humans. It's more efficient than a horse. It's more efficient than a plane or a motorcycle or a car. So if you have one, maybe make sure it works just in case. Isn't it nice to be able to go to the corner store on a bike instead of driving a 4,000 pound car? Doesn't that just make a little bit more sense I am an environmentalist, but I'm not a phony environmentalist. And I'm not saying any of this from an environmental perspective. I'm not telling you if you have to drive 10 miles to work to ride your bike instead, because it's not going to be cheaper. It's going to be more expensive because food is pricier than gas, especially with gas prices as low as they are right now. So yeah, anyway, cycling is on the ultimate cutting edge of so many different things including terrestrial activity itself, but more importantly, things like material science. I'm talking tire compounds. I'm talking carbon fiber. Do you think Formula One had carbon fiber chassis before the Tour de France had carbon fiber bikes? I hope you don't think that because that would be very sad. So in any case, don't you see some benefit into owning a bike? And I'm talking about a nice bike here, by the way. Like one that you would buy from a bike shop. You get clipless pedals and shoes, like have, have the maximum power output. I mean, you realize having clipless pedals nearly doubles your power output. So, you know, get a set of those, get some shoes that match up with them. And that will change your life right there. You can put these on any bike, no matter how cheap. So I was just thinking of upgrades that anybody could do to make their bike much more efficient. And let me tell you, switching to clipless pedals and shoes, you will be addicted immediately. Now, regarding bike racing, 
I got my start in mountain biking in 97. I started cross country mountain biking and we got a lot of preppers that watch our channel. And let me, let me tell you, the rules of mountain bike racing are self-sufficiency. That's, that's the main rule. Like you're not allowed to accept assistance from a spectator or even another racer. Most bike racers help each other out. But uh, if I get a flat or I break a chain link during a race and another, another rider helps me and then a, a different rider protests, I will get relegated to last place. That's the rules of mountain biking. Now, mountain bikers never protest that stuff because they typically have a, a better understanding of uh, the way the world works. So, but the rules are the rules. I'm sure it's probably happened more than once. I know Travis Brown, who used to be the ultimate 24 hour racer, um, had two mechanical problems during the race, got a chain tool from a spectator, fixed his chain, still won the race, and nobody protested. So just a little bit of mountain bike history for you there. Now, the transitory nature of cycling is something that mimics life itself, doesn't it? I mean, in many ways, riding a bike is the ultimate way of planning for the future, right? You're living in the moment, but the whole time you're looking 10 feet, 100 feet, 1,000 feet, sometimes even dozens of miles ahead. And having the things like clothing, physical abilities, and skills necessary to ride a bike thousands of miles per year is more than a hobby or a lifestyle. The point is, support your cutting edge bike shop. Support your local bike shop. And, you know, if you have any doubts as to how cutting edge a sport of cycling is, let's go back in history. Let's look at some more history of cycling, shall we? Guess what the Wright brothers were before they invented the airplane? If you weren't aware, they were bicycle mechanics. So, stay tuned to the channel as we are considering the idea of switching careers in some major ways. So visit the links in the description to pages such as minds.com, PayPal one-time donations, uh, facebook.com slash smash mash instagram.com slash smash mash Patreon, if you'd like to have a monthly subscription, $1, $2, $3 makes a huge difference and increases the likelihood that our daily space weather videos will continue. Um, we're going to have more original music soon in additional locations. Right now, it's mainly on soundclick.com slash Productions, And there's some upcoming networking going on also. So in addition to everything that I've said here, hey, some of the stuff is classified. So we are telling you a lot of the stuff, though. Pardon the long video. Now, let's spend a moment talking about finances. Our channel operates not on a shoestring budget. Our channel op operates, no, not really on a dental floss budget either. Our channel operates on, I don't know, a human hair budget, spider web budget. It's, it's smaller than a shoestring budget. So, um, if anything goes wrong, our videos will stop coming out. So we need to raise a lot of money to ensure that the channel continues to be made. Um, there's more branding going on. There's all kinds of things happening behind the scene right now. But we need sponsors for not only the channel, but also cycling. We plan to do some racing in the form of time trials. I plan to do some racing in the form of time trials. Not the channel. We'll have some updates on it. But So there's a lot of stuff going on. And, uh, I mean, I'm going to be buying a new road bike soon and I got to buy other, all, all sort of other mechanical stuff because we're kind of at a nexus here, a nexus point where we've got to change a whole lot of stuff around. <coughs> Excuse me. So we're looking at getting more software. We're looking at getting more hardware for the channel, 
as well as a lot of hardware for cycling. So last but not least, we encourage everybody who views our channel to get out of your comfort zone today. Don't put it off. Putting it off is just creates more stress and procrastination. Do it today. Get, get out of your comfort zone. Do something you suck at. You got an old bike in the shed? Go out and put lube on the chain, check the tires, make sure the wheels spin, and then go out and ride the bike. Go learn how to do something you're bad at, right? Break the patterns of your life. The more different things that you attempt to do, the better you'll be at all things. Without adversity, there is zero growth. So, in closing, thanks for tuning in, everybody. May the solar wind be at your back and the atherosclerosis absent from your blood vessels. <laughs>